All right, so now, now, now is when you should be doing career planning. Whenever now is. I didn't even begin to do any career planning until my senior year in college. I didn't really realize how important that was. By failing to do it, I actually probably knocked myself out of graduate school for a year, even though I was qualified to get into it. Because I didn't know what I needed to do to move to the next level, because I didn't really know what the next level was. So understanding what opportunities exist in the degrees that you're pursuing becomes paramount to getting the kind of job you want when you get ready to graduate and go out and look for that job or go to the higher level of education still. Caveat, again, same deal. Got some rough estimates, some old statistics, but I'm trying to make big points that are, I think, very valid points. They're not beyond debate and if you want to debate, we can do that. But at the same time, I think you'll find the general gist that I'm providing is very, very much pertinent to most college goers or people who are considering changing careers and potentially going back to school. So why do career planning now? Well, before we had that, more money, more freedom, and greater job security from getting the college degree. In addition to that, if you plan ahead, you're more likely to enjoy what you do for a living because you're more likely to get the job you want, not the job you have to have to pay back all those debts or to pay all those bills. You're more likely to hit a target if you're actually aiming. And Lewis Carroll or Charles Dodson died in 1898, a mathematician, logician, church deacon for the Church of England, photographer, and of course a writer of Alice in Wonderland. All right, I just like this dialogue between Cheshire Cat and Alice. Would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? Well, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added as an explanation. Oh, you're sure to do that, said the cat, if only you walk long enough. So I walked my way into a psychology career, but I didn't have a target I was aiming at. And it took me longer to get there. And looking back, I wouldn't change it because it made me the person I am now. And I have a lot of wisdom to share that I gained the hard way. And I would like to share that with you now. So figuring out the target and not just winding up somewhere is more likely to happen if you do some planning. Why do it at all? Exploring areas of potential interest. Then exploring career possibilities within those areas of potential interest. What do you do when you narrow down those possibilities? Do you need to go straight into the employment field or do you need to go get more education, advanced degrees perhaps? And then when you're done and you're out there, you find you're never really done. How do you maintain that fulfilling career? You don't get burned out, right? Or you don't get placed out of a job and don't have any alternatives. So why do it at all? Planning helps you get a career. And like I say, if you do what you love for a living, you never work a day in your life. Worst day in psychology is better than my best day in a lot of other jobs. Survey of 5,000 households conducted in fall of 2012 indicates that only 47.3% of currently employed Americans are satisfied with their current position. Ouch. That means one out of two people aren't satisfied with the job they have, but are probably sticking with the job they have because they feel lucky to have a job at all. So you look over here, satisfaction. Right? The list of things that people say contribute to their satisfaction in a job. Growth potential, communication channels, recognition, performance review processes. Number five is interest in work. Being interested in the work. But then you flip over here and look at the number one reason for turnover, leaving a job. Lack of interest in the work. So over here is number five for satisfaction. Over here, it's number one for dissatisfaction, if you look at it that way. So finding something that you're interested in, finding something you have passion for, is something you should be doing during your college years. If you don't, you're winding up probably unsatisfied. We want to avoid regret. Why do this career planning? To avoid regret. What do we see? Well, most people, look at here, percentage of college graduates sorted by major who answered satisfied or very satisfied to the question, overall, how satisfied are you with your current career path, path up to now? The best is 54%, right? 
at least a big chunk of people in the best situation not currently satisfied. The worst is psychology. That's what I do. And I would have been in that position, right, of being unsatisfied. Only 26% satisfied, right, over 70% unsatisfied. Why are they unsatisfied? For the reason I would have been unsatisfied. I didn't know that you needed a graduate degree to be a therapist. Not knowing that, I didn't really prepare to go to grad school. So there I would have been at the end of a long, hard road with a bachelor's degree in hand, not having the qualifications I needed to do the job I thought I might want to do. Well, I didn't even want to do psychology up front. I got into college, community college, and I love philosophy. And I was going to do a philosophy degree. And I was almost done with that when I was challenged by somebody. What are you going to do with a philosophy degree when you get done? And I didn't have an answer. I don't know. Maybe I'll uh, serve fries and cook burgers and talk to customers about Nietzsche and Socrates. I, I don't know what I would do with it, really. I didn't understand that it could be used for pre-law or to go into other areas. I didn't know that I could be a professor. Most people didn't think I would ever get any higher education. They thought I should be dead and nerd in jail. And I'm not. <laughs> So what else are you going to do? I, I went to school and kind of fell my way through it. I fell into different options and paths. But then I thought, well, gosh, maybe I could do something like with therapy. Maybe I could work. I had such a, I trashed my adolescence. I was a little ne'er-do-well delinquent, right? Maybe I could go out and help adolescents find a better path. And if I could get paid for that, I thought, well, that'd be cool, right? I'd be working indoors. I'd probably have some benefits, right? I'd have a little bit of job security. And I'd be doing something that was fulfilling. And I thought that would be cool. But I didn't really know how to do that or what to do to get into that. And in this case, you find that a lot of people don't know that. So when you're doing planning, you got to think about things like what's the job market like where you're going to go? What kind of options do you have if you pick major A, major B, or major C? So avoiding regret, we look up here, the rising cost of not going to college. Well, that's usefulness of major by field of study over here on the far left. Percentage of majors in each area who say their current job is related to their major in college or graduate school, with this dark area over here being very closely related, and this light area over here being not at all. Those with science and engineering degrees think that their work and their careers, by and large, 60% feel it's very closely related to their training. In business, social sciences, much less so. It's a less than a majority. College days reconsidered, looking back. Now you get out of college, percent who say doing each of the following while they were in undergraduate programs would have better prepared them to get the job they wanted. Gaining more work experience. 50% said they should have gotten more work experience. I didn't know I needed work experience. I got it accidentally. I fell into a senior seminar, a community seminar, community psychology. So I went and worked at the homeless shelter and got some experience and practical, you know, work there. In another senior seminar, I went and did work at a runaway and homeless youth shelter. And I got some experience there as part of my class, not as part of a plan to get a job, right? So I wound up getting something that was useful to me, getting a job later, not knowing that's what I was doing. Studying harder. 38% said that. Well, I did that. I studied hard. Too hard. That's why I got the How to Study seminar, so you could study efficiently. <laughs> hard, yes, but efficiently. Looking for work sooner. I didn't know when I needed to look for a job. I was almost in my final semester before it occurred to me that I should start looking for a job now. Choosing a different major. Almost one in three people said they should have picked a different major. I almost graduated with a major that isn't in the field that I do right now. And it's been said that one in five people over the lifetime stay in that major career, major related field. In other words, four out of five people tend to change careers out of the major field into some other field for whatever reason. Personal satisfaction, jobs dry up, layoffs, transitions, moving, whatever the case may be. Percent of millennials aged 25 to 32 in each group who say their education was very useful in preparing them for a job or career. 41%. Right? And it breaks down the highest levels bachelor's degree, lowest levels high school. So it's got a value, but you've got to know what to do with it. How do you apply that value? Start looking for areas of potential interest. Nicest opportunities provided by colleges, they make you do general education classes. Most people don't think that's cool. Like, I don't want to do that. I ain't got any interest in that. Well, have you ever done it before? No. Well, then how do you know? 
right? They make you pick classes that are outside your comfort zone and you may wind up taking a psych class in my case or an engineering class or an art class or a history class or any field that you might happen to be in English and go, wow, I didn't know this was cool. I didn't know that was interesting. Now I'm taking it. Maybe if it turns you on at that moment, that's interesting to me. That should make you think, well, if it interested me, maybe I should look more into that. Go find the department that houses the courses that interest you. Talk to faculty there. Talk to advisors there. Maybe talk to graduate students or other students. Like, what do you like about this? What makes you fulfilled in this role? What kind of careers are available in this area? If I get a degree, what kind of jobs would I do? Where would I look? Then declare a major and or a minor or multiples of these. Uh, being almost done with my Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy, I advised myself by reading the actual catalog, being an older student, non-traditional, and I found out I could get two degrees. I could double major, or I could get a Bachelor of Arts in one and a Bachelor of Science in another if I just take a few more classes. So that's what I did. So I wanted what, an associate's degree, associate arts from Central Piedmont Community College, and then graduated UNC Charlotte with a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy and a Bachelor of Science in Psychology. Now, I don't think that having both those degrees has even bought me a cup of coffee in my life, but I did them. And they were part of me, and I devoted time and effort to them, but I switched. If it doesn't fit, change. Change before you get in too deep. But resist that I'm too far in to switch, right? People are like, oh, I've already got a lot of debt. I've got to get out. I've got to get into the job market. I've got to get out of here. I just need to graduate. Well, some people might have a low GPA, and they go, I just need to graduate. I'll come back. I can come back and take classes later. Don't do that if you might ever need graduate education. Bring that GPA up. Be up as high as you can before you graduate. Once you graduate, that's your locked in undergraduate GPA and it stays with you for a lifetime. So if you got D's or F's, a lot of people do. Don't feel bad about it. Buck up, go re-enroll in the same classes and do much better the next time, right? Replace that grade, improve the GPA before you graduate. And if you need to change, change. I am ever so glad I changed. I don't know, I think I wound up like 150 undergraduate hours by the time I was done, right? And I had wife, kids, job, etc. But man, I'm glad I changed and got psychology because now I do this for a living. I get to do what I love, which would never have happened if I didn't happen to find my way into psychology and be willing to make that change late in the game. Now I use psych as an example, but this applies across all professions, right? There are a lot of potential careers for any given degree, so it's all about how you market yourself and your degree. You look at psychology as an example, and people are like, well, what good is it? You know, you get that useless degree. Well, it's not a useless degree. You're not spinning it right. You get a lot of skills in psychology that even if you don't become a psychologist, and there's lots of different kinds of psychologists you could be, not just a therapist. There's over 50 divisions in APA, all kinds of things you could do in that field, but even outside of that field, you could do administration, business, counseling's within the field, criminal justice, customer service, economics or financial planning, education, healthcare, human resources, law, legal services, industry, marketing, mass communications, political science, politics, public health, research, sales, social work, sports, on and on and on and on and on. You have this broad set of skills and a bachelor's degree. It's about selling yourself and your skills to the job you want to get. So finding out what you can get, market your savvy and be aware of what the market's like. Be mindful of what kind of job prospects you have. See where that career is headed in the big picture. Is it stable? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? What qualifications do you need? Consider whether you'll be able to find employment. Using clinical psych as an example, which just happens to be my area, but any example, right? I'm looking right here, careers in psychology. Where can you find this? Well, this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's public information. If you know to be looking for it, I certainly didn't know to be looking for it as an undergraduate. Now looking back, I go, oh, I could have honed in really quickly on what I wanted to do and really built up my credentials to make a much smoother transition to that career path. So. Opportunities in psychology will continue to grow over the next decade. Well, that's 2011, so we're good to go for at least, right, 2021. Job prospects should be best for people who have a doctoral degree. Wow, that would be good to know. If I didn't know it, I'd be disappointed, wouldn't I? In certain fields, clinical counseling, health, and school psych, 
because the increased demand for psychological services also needed work with an aging population, one that's diversifying rapidly. There's people who've done these analyses for you as to what kinds of degrees go into what kind of paths. I was at the bank once and I saw this woman as a teller behind the counter. I'm standing in line and one of her buddies comes in and her buddy says, hey, how you doing? And she goes, terrible. I can't even find a job. I mean, wow. Loud enough for everybody to hear, right? Now, I'm thinking, looks like you got a job, but if you talk that loud, that negative, you might not have it for long because surely everybody and your manager just heard that pronouncement. But what she really means is she just graduated and she started going on and on. She can't find the job she wants and felt entitled to after having done all that education, paid all that money and all so and so and so and so. Well, there may not be that job in Johnson City, right? You think about those kinds of jobs and what those kinds of jobs depends on what kind of career you want. Let's say you want to be a teacher. Let's say I want to be a high school teacher in Johnson City. Well, guess what you uh, find in Johnson City? A lot of people qualified to teach. Lots of them. Why? Because we have this university right here that trains people to be educators. So many of them are from here and they stay here and then they saturate the market which isn't that big to begin with, right? You can teach at Science Hill or University High if you want to teach at the high school level. So guess what? They already got people in those jobs and there's a long line waiting to get it. So if you didn't plan ahead, it would come as a shock to you that you can't get the job you wanted. But you might be able to go to Irwin or Greenville or a different county and get a job that you want if you're planning ahead. If you're planning ahead, you might be networking with those places and finding out when openings might be coming and when you need to apply and who you need to talk to, job prospects are something people just don't think about. Now, once you've got an idea of where you want to go, what's the formula to get you there? Preparing for advanced education, preparing for employment, when should you prepare? Prepare now. Right? This is the time. Like I said, it's never too late. You can always go back and do additional education, but before you graduate would be ideal. And if you need to add a year on to do it right, I would highly recommend adding a year on to do it right. If you need to fix the GPA, if you need to get certain experiences that make you more competitive to get certain opportunities, well, that would be well in your interest. So my three-part part formula per doula, GPA counts. I did get a good GPA, but I didn't realize early on how important that was. It became very important to go to grad school. But I didn't know about grad school when I was getting those A's when I first went in. I was a non-traditional student. I had had my wildlife experiences. And if I'm doing this, I'm doing it right, putting my all into it. And I got a good GPA. Well, that helped out a lot. But if you need to, you mean do as well as you can. A high GPA doesn't make you a better person than anybody else. I know people graduate with a two-point low GPA, and we're the same, right? We're the same value. But the options are limited for them. I know one that I love very much that got his psych undergrad and went out and made a lot of money. Sales, because psych applies to sales. And he did well. Got a house, worked with him and his wife and got nice things, got kids, and then got sick of sales. So he then went and retrained himself because he had to realize that he needed to move into a different area. Got trained for real estate right when the bottom dropped out of the real estate market. All gone. So then he goes to learn to drive trucks. Nothing in the world wrong with driving trucks. It's a very noble profession as all of them are, right? You just don't need a bachelor's degree to do it, right? And so here he is retraining because that two point low, he could have been a teacher. He could have been, uh, I mean like a, a, a college. He could have gone and gotten an MBA and gone in business and all kinds of options that just weren't open. Not because he isn't a great person, because he is, but because the GPA wasn't there. And click, once you graduate, you lock it in. So look at your later performance. You can sometimes differentiate your first 60 hours versus your last 60 hours. A lot of people go in and blow their first semesters and maybe even first years because they're just not accustomed to it. They're not acclimated to it. They have it up here that they need to go to college, but they don't have it down here that they get to go to college and they don't put their all into it and they have a bad first year, but then they light comes on they start doing much better. Well, a lot of programs you might apply to or jobs you might apply to, if the GPA is relevant, a lot of jobs don't even ask you what your GPA is, right? They just ask you, do you have a degree? 
But if you need to report your GPA, you can say, well, look, you can see I got a lot of 4.0s and 3.9s in my last few semesters because I really turned it on there at the end when I finally realized what this could do for me. You can highlight the maturity process and the realization that you got really serious about a career. GRE, LSAT, MCAT, PCAT, OAT, Praxis, these are entrance exams, license exams for graduate programs and certain kinds of uh, professions. So study really, really hard for these. I always tell people, study like your life depends on it, but then walk into the test realizing you can take it as many times as you want to. If you don't pressure yourself, you won't study because a lot of people are scared of these. I was scared of the GRE. Math was not my strong point, right? I'm pretty verbal, but math scared me. And I didn't know how to study or why to study or what to study. And I felt helpless, and so I studied psychology for the subject test, thinking ignorantly that if I'm going to get into a graduate program in psychology, now that I'm going to go to grad school, whatever that is, they should really care how much I know about psychology. Turns out, they don't. Most programs don't require it, and most programs nowadays don't even look at the psychology subject test for the GRE. So I spent all that time studying, and I got 80th percentile, which is excellent. I didn't spend any time studying the main GRE, and I got 50th percentile, which sounds about right. I'm bright. Everybody in college has brightness. Brightness doesn't make you good, but it's an ability to work with information. But I'm not a genius. I work hard. But if I'd worked on studying the right thing, I might have gone to a different graduate program much earlier and accelerated my career. But I thought, well, man, this is like going to expose me as a fraud. Everybody who excels has that kind of hidden worry that, oh, one day people are going to find out I'm no genius. They keep thinking I'm bright because I'm going to college, but I'm not bright. I'm just persistent, right, and hardworking. Everybody feels like that, but these tests are not IQ tests. They are gameable, meaning you can study for them and get better at them. I'll show you. Take them long before your expected application to programs so you can take them again if you need to. So take the pressure off when you walk in to take the test. Do your deep breathing from our test anxiety seminar. Get relaxed and do your best. If it's not what you want, you take it again. It's expensive, but when you look at making an extra million or two million dollars over the course of your lifetime, a few hundred bucks invested again and again is not a bad payoff, right? Then there's everything else. <laughs> Everything else. Well, if you're going into employment, well, it may be what work experiences you had. It may be what your GPA is, but probably it's what your degree is and how applicable it is or how you can sell your degree to the employer as being relevant to the position. But if you're going into graduate programs, whether it's medical school or, or graduate programs or law school or whatever the case may be, right, everybody's got a GPA who's applying. And they're probably going to be mostly good. Everybody's got a GRE or LSAT or MCAT, etc. Who's applying? They're probably going to be mostly good. So how else do you stand out? What else did you do? Well, in some areas, research experience would be very good to get. Other areas, volunteer experience or leadership experiences, work experiences, references, and it goes on your Vita and your resume. I didn't know what a Vita was. Vita? What's a Vita? They keep talking about a Vita. It's just a fancy resume. For academics, you just put a lot more stuff on it. A resume is one page. You better not make it more than one page. Synopsis, view in a nutshell. The Vita goes on and on and on and on about all the stuff you've been doing since you started your academic career. Helpful to know. Didn't know about it until much, much later. I was already in a master's program before I learned what that was. Just to point out that you can make a difference in these tests and don't need to be intimidated by them. They're just for-profit organizations. They're happy to have you take that test as many times as you want to. And it turns out that they tend to look, they being the people making the selection, at the highest score you achieved. Not the latest score you achieve, because they report their numbers and they report the ones that look best. Right? So here we have a person. This is a real person off of a real application that we took some time ago back in the old style score of the GRE when it used to be scored on 800, 800, perfect score 1600. That doesn't matter. What really matters is your percentile. 503. 390, which was 28th percentile. That's not good. Means, right, only 27% of the people did worse than you. Over here in the quantitative section, 42nd percentile. Eh, moderate. Writing? Pretty solid. 87th percentile. But now you got to look at this and you say, well, gosh, shouldn't that, should, that didn't mean a lot, does it, right? That's not really predictive. Weakly predictive. 
But when you've got a pile of applications to a program this tall and you don't know anybody, what's the first thing you go on to make the first cut? It's the numbers. Whether that's right or wrong, it's what they have. Unless you've made some inroads to get to know these people, then you're just a file to them and you're going to be summarized as numbers. This person realized that wasn't good enough for them. They went back five months later. They studied. Right? If it's an IQ test, you'd get the same score every time or very near the same score every time. They go back five months later. Now they bump up to the 37th percentile. Not great, but substantially better. 61st percentile, substantially better. Broke it down to 52nd, dropped. But look what their high was, right? So now both of them would be reported and people would see that. But you can see where they put their focus on studying, right? That wasn't good enough. Two months later, they go back. 73rd percentile, 73rd percentile, 71st percentile with a high of 87th percentile. That is super solid credentials right there. And that plus a good GPA plus a bunch of the other stuff that we're talking about is what you need to get that interview, to get that first crack, to get your foot in the door, to maybe get in that program. So don't be scared. <laughs> be involved. Be involved in finding out what you need to do to get where you want to go. Volunteer and join relevant organizations. Fraternities and sororities are great organizations. They do a lot of charity work, right? If they've got committees, Get on those committees, because if you're chairing the committee for the charity work or the fundraising or the public relations or whatever, that's a leadership position that goes where? On your Vita, right? Because people go, well, gosh, you got a good GPA, you got a good score on your standardized test. What else did you do? Oh, you're a leader in an organization. What other organizations? Well, using Psych as an example, we have an honor society in Psych High. It's based on a GPA, but if you make the cutoff, get in it. I didn't know to do that as an undergrad. I went to my uh, community college, and I was the uh, technical director at Pease Auditorium there for a while. So I ran the lights for when they had people would rent out the auditorium. And they had this honor society, and there I am up in the light booth, and the place is packed with family and friends, and people are going up to get these little honoraria. And I'm thinking, what a bunch of pompous bullshit is this? Ah, uh, yeah. Because when you don't understand something, what do you do? You put it down. You denigrate it. You don't try to learn. Much, much later, people are like, man, you get in the, uh, you get in the honor society? I'm like, no, why would I give them 50 bucks to tell me I'm smart? I got a GPA. I know I got, I know I got good grades. I don't need to pay them to tell me I'm smart. And they're like, dude, that goes on your Vita. That goes on your resume. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. My ignorance is now lifted. And I went and joined four of them suckers that week. Everybody got my 50 bucks, right? Golden Key, Sigma Tau, uh, Phi Kappa Phi, and Psi Chi. And then my, guess what? My little resume section went boop and expanded. I didn't know to become involved. I would have said, I don't have time to become involved. I got work, I got kids, I got all these classes. I don't got time for getting involved. But later, come to find out, I would have been well served if I had made time to get involved because it doesn't really take much time. One hour meeting a month, it's not really much commitment. Being on a committee sometimes might be an extra hour a month depending on how active the organization is. But there's other professional groups. So we've got APA, APS, ABA, PSYOP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In certain sub areas of psychology, if you were a student and you were savvy, you might be a student member of these organizations and get on that that list that they have what? Resources that they send to you that tell you how to get in the career. Depending on the career, you can find opportunities in your community to volunteer helping people. For us, that matters, right? Gives you experience, talk about your application, opportunities to meet potential recommenders, which we'll talk about in a minute. Shows you have dedication to helping others. In psych, you might work on crisis call lines, uh, crisis shelters, charity organizations, interventions, like Boys Girls Club, Coalition for Kids, tutoring people, shadowing, interning for employers or actual jobs like at Woodridge or Youth Villages. You could get paid to get work experience. Or you can volunteer to get experience. And now people know that you're a stand-up person who shows up and takes responsibility and they can recommend you. Right? So most people are like, man, I didn't know I need recommenders. Yeah, three letters of recommendation if you're going the graduate route. Right? And what all employers want? List of references. Well, who are they going to be? They can't be your moms and your dads. Right? It's got to be somebody that's not related to you, that knows you professionally. 
you're in a sorority or fraternity, other student group, become a leader. You know who runs the world? The people who show up. Most of these organizations, you've got an active membership of about five. President, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and the other person. Right? And you know what you can do? You can change your constitution like we did, and now we've got a PR manager. So that person's got, right? We've got more people because we try to reach out to other people and tell them about the opportunities, but we've got committees. We've got a constitution committee, a fundraising committee. You can be a chair of a committee, a co-chair of a committee, a member of a committee. You stay active long enough, you can easily become the treasurer, or the secretary, or the vice president or president. If you know to get involved early, now you're building experience because I didn't know this until I got into my graduate level. I started getting involved in the graduate student assemblies and graduate student government. I was a representative for psychology for the Graduate Student Government Association at both Appalachian State and Virginia Tech. And I learned all kinds of important, relevant things because I learned Robert's Rules of Order. How many people know what Robert's Rules of Order were? And I had no clue. It's how you run a meeting. It's how you run the government. Right? It's how you do procedure to get meetings accomplished in fair and efficient manners. And it's relevant because guess what we do in my job now? I'm on all kinds of committees. I've been on faculty senate. We do those things. Call the meeting to order. I make a motion. Second the motion. Is there any discussion? I, I call for the vote. Let's have a vote. The yeas have it. The nays have it. Who abstains? I didn't know any of that until I got active in student government, right? So being involved in these leadership opportunities actually gives you experience that may very well be quite relevant down the road. You don't go to grad school, you go to work, you might be the leader of a work group, right? You might be a supervisor. These kinds of opportunities help you out. So when do you prepare? Now, 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 now. I didn't. <laughs> so do your lab work, do your field work. Work with faculty if they will use undergraduates as assistants. I didn't know you needed research experience till my last semester. Somebody's man, you ought to get some research experience. From whom? From faculty. I go knocking on doors. People are like, no, I've already got two undergraduates. I don't really need another one. But apparently I need this. And I go to Dr. Stanley Hagen, Peg Stanley Hagen, and I ask her. She's like, well, I got a graduate student and two undergraduates. I don't really need another assistant. I'm like, but apparently I need this. And I had been a tutor for the psych department, and she was my supervisor, so she knew I was a stand-up person who was going to take responsibility. She goes, all right, I'll let you work with us. I collected data one day and entered data in the mainframe a few times and got a little bit of face time with her to mentor me into some ideas that I didn't know existed, right? So that opportunity wouldn't have happened unless I happened to got word late in the game that I needed to do that. Going PhD versus Ed D, Psy D, Masters in our world using psych as an example, right? Research might be more valuable than volunteer experience for an organization, but if you can get both, great. But, you know, if you're interested in going from MD, medical doctor, to DO, well then shadowing doctors might be a better use of your time than research. Finding out what is relevant, right? Well, we have a medical professionals advisory group at, U at ATSU that will help you if you join it. Know what you need to do and how you need to do it. But most people don't know about that. And if you don't know the difference between MD, DO, PhD, ED, PsyD, MA, MS, that's normal. I had no clue what all that was. It's a bunch of gobbledygook alphabet soup to me. And it is to most people, right? But if you think you might want to do something like this for a career, then all you got to do nowadays is Google it. And I bet there's a Wikipedia entry on it. And I'll tell you all about it. So I didn't know to do that kind of stuff. So I was at that disadvantage that I don't want you to be at. And look at here. Graduate programs in psychology, there's a book on it. You can get last year's version on Amazon.com for a few bucks. All right? There's a website for the professional organizations that run the crediting bodies and other kinds of organizations that are related to the kind of thing you want to do. Be realistic. Like I said, the woman who got the degree apparently that wasn't going to get her the job she wanted may not have been realistic. Is it available is the first question. Will it be available in 10 years is another question. But even if I narrow it down and go, well, I want to be a PhD in psychology. Well, what kind? Right? Clinical PhD is the most competitive PhD program there is. It's even slightly more competitive in medical school. Not harder than medical school, right? Harder to get into. It's a high popularity. Let's say you take, uh, just for ease of my mathematics, 500 applicants for medical school, 
And let's say you actually take 100 into your first class. They're usually not that big, but that's 20% acceptance rate. We got over 100 applications, and we may take six. So it's a 6% acceptance rate. And in Tennessee, to get a PhD, not a PsyD, right, a PhD, there's ETSU, there's UT, there's Vanderbilt, there's Peabody, which is at Vanderbilt, right, and there is University of Memphis. Each of them, if you look at that, if they each took five people a year, you're talking about 25 slots in Tennessee. So you best apply broadly, not to one program, but to lots of programs. And there's different levels of getting in. Clinical psychology has its own table. Getting into a clinical master's program, about 40% of people get in who apply. So that's what I did. I didn't know about what I was doing, but I went to a master's program first. I did very well there, which helped position me to get into a PhD program, which was much more competitive, right? So that's something I didn't even know I was doing that I did. But you can see that there's all kinds of differential acceptance rates for different kinds of sub-disciplines within our discipline. And that's the same thing with engineering. That's the same thing with art. That's the same thing with history. Whatever your thing is, right, there's going to be different programs that do that. When you're getting ready, if you're applying, right, you don't need your transcripts. But if you're applying to jobs, I mean... Applying to jobs, you don't need your transcripts. They're not going to probably pull your transcripts for a job. They're going to say, what are your qualifications and how do you fit this job? Why should we hire you, essentially? But if you're going to a different level of education, well, now you better get your transcripts. Well, guess what? They charge you for that, right? Not only do they charge you for that, they're not going to do it tomorrow, right? So if you go, oh, gosh, this deadline to apply for this program is Friday, it's Monday, and I go tomorrow and ask them to get my transcripts to them by Friday, in most schools, that ain't going to happen, which means you don't get to apply this year, which means you might wait another calendar year depending on the program. Some admit in fall and spring. Some admit only in spring. Some admit only in fall. So if it's that kind of program, you'd be SOL. But you didn't know. Letters of intent, statement of purpose, you better project confidence because they don't want to get somebody who goes, well, I think I kind of want to do this, but I'm not really sure. All right, if I take six people into my program, they better damn well convince me they want to be in my program. They know what my program is. They know what we do. They have some kind of plan for how that will get them to the career they want to go. Do they have to do that once they graduate? Nah. In fact, how would they know that's really what they want to do until they actually get in the program and try it out? And once you get in the program, if you wanted to switch programs, then in some cases that's possible. I've seen people switch entire departments before, not in our program, but in other places I've been. Right? So once they got into grad school, they found out that thing that they thought was going to be the thing for them wasn't the thing for them. And they found another thing for them, and they were fortunate enough to be able to switch to a whole other department. Right? But getting in is the key. There's no doctoral police or master's police that are going to come at the end and say, now on your statement, you said you were going to do this, and you ain't doing that. Once you get your degree, you do what you want. I do what I want. I want to do what I'm doing. I'm happy to do what I'm doing. But make sure you spell check that thing and grammar check it. Being ignorant, I sent a, uh, uh, one of my original three applications not knowing I should make 15 to 20 of them. One of them went to Duke. Now, I didn't know that they didn't take people with 50 percentile GRE scores. So that was a wasted 50 bucks. And I also sent them a statement of purpose saying I wanted to become more acquainted with this type of psychology, right? At least that's what I thought it said because it was spell checked and I took the automatic correction. And when I went to go edit it for the next of the three applications, I found out that I had already mailed off. I longed to become more antiquated with this type of psychology. Grammar check that sucker, right? Read it because it's a writing sample, right? They might read it and go, man, this person can't even write. He doesn't even know what antiquated means versus acquainted. Now, that's not true, but that's what it would look like on paper. Highlight your fit and your accomplishments. And don't be too revealing about personal issues, right? If you had a hard year because of some personal issues or some family issues, you might explain, well, my, GA took, my GPA took a hit when I had some, some personal struggles that I had to get through for my family. You might say that, but that's about where I would leave it. But as you can see, I went back and fixed the Fs and the Ds, and I really got myself straight in that last year, and I'm certain I want to go forward. Being too revealing shows that you don't have boundaries. Even if it's purely true, I was too revealing in my first application essay. Very much just honest about why I wanted to study what I want to study. And then I got feedback when I didn't get into the, those three programs, one of them being my home program where I had been that 3925 and senior of the year. And like, why do you let me in your program? 
And I didn't know they don't usually take people from their program into their master's program. They take people from other places. I didn't know that. And they said, well, you said this on your, on your transcript, too, on your uh, statement. People started wondering. I'm like, but that's when I was a kid. I was pointing out that that made me want to do this. And they're like, yeah, but. And I'm thinking, well, y'all are psychologists. You shouldn't be biased, right? You should be open. Well, guess what? Psychologists are people, too, right? If you're a doctor, just because you know all about viruses and bacteria doesn't make you immune to viruses and bacteria. And just because you're a psychologist and knows academically all about biases doesn't make you unbiased, right? They start looking for red flags. You got a big pile of applications, and you see red flags. That makes the pile smaller. Practical. Letters of recommendation. Letters of reference. Well, get... Professors, if you can, if that's what your, whatever the terminal degree in your field is. If it's MFA, get some MFAs to write you a, a letter of recommendation. Why? Not because they're better people, but because the people who are trying to select you into this program, right, want to know if you can do it. Who better to recommend you than somebody who has done it? So if you can get PhDs, if you're trying to get a PhD, and you can get MDs if you're trying to get an MD, MFAs if you want a Master of Fine Arts, that helps because they can make statements from experience saying, I think this person has what it takes to get through and succeed and excel even. Those with terminal degrees are prefer preferable, but again, just because they've been there and done that, not because they're better people. And some people are like, I don't have anybody like that. I had one woman, once. she's like, I've worked at Walmart for like five or six years. I, I wouldn't use anybody there. I'm like, what do you do there? She's like, well, I'm a manager. I'm like, you work at the same place for six years and you're up in management? She's like, yeah. I'm like, hell yes. That's awesome, right? Same job, that's persistence, right? And you've moved all the way up from, I think she started out as a uh, teller or a clerk, you know, on the, on the checkout line, and now she's in management with responsibilities. She's got organizational responsibilities. She's got uh, supervisory responsibilities. All kinds of things that somebody who knew her for the six years could write about, and she would sound outstanding. That, that counts, right? But that's what I'm saying. Just be careful. And also ask somebody first this. Would you be willing to write me a positive letter of recommendation? Right? And if they go, sure. Then you say, thank you. And then you don't follow through. Right? If they go, yeah, that's the person you want to write it. I don't want you writing anything less than great stuff. What stuff? Well, here's the kind of stuff people don't think about. I certainly didn't think about. Here's our ETSU, right? This is, this is the recommendation form that I would fill out for a student who's trying to apply to any graduate program at ETSU. All right, so you put in your name. Do you want to be able to see this later? No. Why? Well, I have every right to see it. Of course you do, but when you say no, it means you are confident in people's recommendations of you, right? If you waive your rights to see it, then that means you have confidence that the people who are writing are going to write good things. If you don't waive your right to see it, even though it's not supposed to count against you in any way, shape, or form, knowing human beings, they go, well, if they know that they can pull that file and see what you wrote, maybe they're litigious. Maybe that people didn't actually write the full unbiased truth there. Now, what kind of things might you be rated on? Compared to whom? Undergraduates, master students, doctoral students. Some people go from one career to another. They change them up. Ability to ac uh, master academic work, written expression, ability to write, ability to communicate orally, familiarity with research techniques, ability to work independently, ability to work with others, motivation, perseverance, reliability, and dependability, Inacqu inadequate opportunity to observe, below average, average, top 25, top 10%. Well, how do I know? I got people who come to me and they're like, oh, uh, would you write me a letter of recommendation? I'm like, maybe. Who are you? Like, well, I was in your intro class. I'm like, eh, there's like 650 of those every year. Some of them make themselves known to me and I get to have a relationship with some students who make the effort to talk to me after class on a repeated basis, but I got a lot of those too. But then some people come and work in my lab, some people come into Psych High where I'm a faculty advisor, some people take advanced classes with me, and now I have a basis to know them and be able to write something about them. I'll try to write something for it, but I can't write much about you if all you were in a class and I didn't really know you, I could have a personal conversation with you and find out what your career goals are and say, well, I've spoken with the person. And that would be an honest statement. And they have career goals consistent with this program. And they did really well in my class. But the transcript already says that you did really well in my class. So I'm not really adding anything by saying that. So these are people like myself who didn't think I had to 
to really make themselves known to their faculty in a positive way. Because you can make yourself known to your faculty in a negative way, right? Turns out what? I wound up working with Dr. Stanley Hagen closely in her lab a little bit. But as a tutor, I had those two senior seminars that I took, right? Where I was working in a homeless shelter and reporting every week to a faculty member. And then I was working in a youth shelter and reporting every week to a faculty member. So it turned out I had people who could recommend me. And they recommended me for the actual program that I didn't get accepted to at UNC Charlotte. But I didn't know to do that. So you want them to check off that box up there. Recommend admission strongly. And if they're on your, if you're, if they're on your uh, reference list for employment, you want somebody to be able to call them up and say, Hey, Chris is applying here. And they don't go, Chris Dula who? Right? You want him to go, oh, Chris, do absolutely. Yeah, he was in a couple of my classes. Really, really upstanding dude. He was very dependable, always in class. You could want him to be able to say things about you. Now, maintain that fulfilling career. There's a number of things, just checking them off. Do everything you can to be a valued employee or employer. Treat your people under you with respect. Value them and they'll value you. You'll have a better workplace. Value your coworkers and demonstrate that overtly. Stay up to, date, up to date on developments in your field. Take care of yourself. Make time. We talk about stress and anxiety. You need to build in time to take care of yourself because work isn't going to give that to you. There are so many people in America that don't even take all their vacation time allotted to them. Take every bit allotted to you. Take care of your family. Take care of yourself so you don't burn out and start hating that job, right? Be adaptive. Workforce changes more rapidly, more consistently than ever before in history. You may see your job disappear. Spend less time fretting and complaining and more time adaptively trying to figure out where's my next move. Do I need more training? Do I need to network with people? Are there other similar jobs or do I have to transition to a whole new field? Take risks. It may feel like you're trapped because you've got bills, loyalty, commitments, habits. Scary to change jobs and careers. I'm not unmindful of that. I get that, but gosh, you know, big risks bring big rewards sometimes. And if you do the planning, you're more likely to get the rewards. If you just jump full into something just to jump into it, you may not be satisfied with the outcome. And then most of all, perhaps, believe in yourself. No matter what anybody else says, you're not doing school for them. You're doing it for you. With enough desire, you have to want it bad enough. With enough effort, you have to try hard enough. And enough persistence, you have to stay at it long enough. I started a community college in 1992 and graduated with my PhD in 2003. You've got to stay with it long enough. You can do almost anything. And that's all we have for that talk.